Let's go ahead. So welcome one and all to the NYU AI school. Um, let's jump into a couple of logistics for the school. So there is a Google group that you should uh, be a part of. Um, if not, you can um, always request access and we'll approve you. It should be in the welcome email. Um, there is a Discord server that I think most of you are aware of and have been actively participating in, uh, which is awesome. Um, if there are any issues, um, whether those, those are technical, whether those are non-technical, please feel free to DM the organizers on Discord. Um, we have the admin tags, so you can tag admin, um, especially on technical issues for questions. Um, there will be a, an announcement made every morning with links for the rest of the day. So in case you have an issue with accessing links on Google Calendar or uh, otherwise, you will always get an email in the morning or you can always ask uh, questions about what the day schedule is like. The lectures are meant to be recorded. Um, so we will be recording the lectures, although we will be putting them out only at the end of the week because there is some bandwidth issues. Um, the office hours and labs will not be recorded. So in case you are, uh, uh, you have a choice, uh, in case you have limited time, we would strongly recommend you review the lectures that are recorded and put up from last year, um, which are not the same, but similar uh, on similar topics. Um, and then please attend the labs and office hours because those will not be recorded. Um, this year, the officers are also meant for unstructured discussions. So it's not just that you have to have attended the lab to go to the officers. Um, we have grad students as TAs who have had some experiences that most of you could probably benefit from. Um, and especially who will be able to answer a lot of the questions you might have, which are outside of the scope of the school. Um, for instance, your uh, personal career related questions and uh, questions about how to start research projects and stuff like that. Um, so feel free to attend office hours. Um, the panels, uh, we have two panels this week. Um, we have three panels technically this week. Uh, the first one will be the ML careers panel. The second one will be the bumpy road to AI research panel. And the third one will be an AMA with grad students. Um, for the first two panels, uh, you are strongly recommended to post questions. We will, we will post details of who the panelists are and what the panels are about uh, on Discord shortly uh, and create separate channels for it. But feel free to pre-post your questions uh, in the respective chat so that we can keep track of them and probably ask the panelists those questions um, um, on a priority basis. Um, the lectures are typically from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. E e Eastern Standard Time. Um, so that's New York time. Um, you will have to convert that to your time zone. Um, and the labs are typically from 1 to 3 p.m. We have lunch office hours uh, where we will have grad students um, um, available to discuss um, more or less anything related to AI research with you. And um, we have two tracks for labs and we have multiple sessions for each track. So as you, for most of you have seen the Discord and Google group messages, you have been assigned to a certain track. Um, those are not binding on you. Um, at the same time, um, since you requested a certain track, we put you in that track. Um, please uh, uh, ensure that you have access to a, a Google Colab, um, which is if you have a Gmail account, you probably do. Um, um, we will be using Python and PyTorch for the labs. For the beginner sessions, we will start from scratch. We will give you the basics. Um, for the advanced track, we will go a little faster and probably teach you a bit uh, uh, more detailed uh, concepts. Um, at the same time, the syllabus covered in both of the labs is more or less the same and it will all be released at the end of the school. Um, I think I've been through all of the things I wanted to go through. And with that said, I will hand over, uh, I will pause in case I miss something and the organizers want to correct me. Yes, you can switch the lab tracks. Cool. Uh, with that said, I'll hand over to Savannah. Uh, I'll hand over to Katrina, who will introduce uh, our speaker for the day. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm like happy day one of the AI school. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first lecturer for today. Um, so we are very honored to have Savannah Thais, um, who will be giving the lecture on Intro to AI. She is a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University, working on the inter intersection of AI and um, 
machine learning and physics. And she's also an advocate for AI ethics and in particular algorithmic interpretability. And among many other things, she's also the director at the Women in Machine Learning organization. So uh, we're very excited to have her as a speaker. And uh, without further ado, um, Savannah, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, just a second to set up. Um, I can't turn, I don't know if I'm supposed to have my video on, but I can't turn it on. Uh, let me look into that real quick. Okay, can you see um, the slides okay? Yes, I can see them. Okay, great. Um, awesome. So yeah, thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited uh, to be giving this first lecture today, uh, Introduction to Machine Learning. Um, I'll try to um, monitor the chat as much as possible. So um, feel free to you know, ask questions in the Zoom chat or the Zoom Q&A. Um, I'll also try to take pauses during the lecture um, for questions as well. Um, so first, yeah, a quick intro to who I am. Um, so I, uh, my background is originally in physics. Um, so I did a PhD in computational particle physics, um, where I developed machine learning um, methods for uh, processing data at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, which is a big particle accelerator. Um, so really at the intersection of, of data science, machine learning, and physics. And I'm now a research scientist at Princeton um, doing, uh, like Katrina mentioned, research in several different areas. Um, so physics-informed machine learning, like how we can teach um, algorithms about uh, physics information that we already know, um, how, uh, algorithmic interpretability and robustness, how we can make sure that the systems that we're building are trustworthy and, and understandable by humans, and um, regulation of emerging technology. Um, so, you know, how we can uh, kind of govern these systems and make sure they're used um, fairly and equitably. And then some machine learning for social good and community-based data advocacy, trying to use um, this technology to have a positive impact. Um, so a quick outline of the talk, I'm gonna go through a kind of history of artificial intelligence. How do we kind of think about these systems and how did we get um, to where we're at today? Um, a uh, introduction to some machine learning concepts. We'll, you'll dive deeper into a lot of these topics um, in the later lectures. So I'm gonna just do a quick kind of primer um, to help get ready for that. And then I'll introduce two really common areas that again, you're gonna focus on later in the um, school in the next couple of days. So we'll talk about computer vision and natural language processing. Um, and then I'll um, talk a bit about the state of machine learning today, what kind of questions still exist, um, ways that you can get involved in this space and kind of where we see the field going next. Um, yeah, so really excited to get started with this. Um, so first, a kind of history of AI and, and kind of how we got where we are today. Um, so uh, first, uh, some quick caveats and framing. Um, so 
uh, caveats for kind of this history. Uh, the history that I've put together here is, is really focused on innovations that led to the development of neural networks, which are a certain kind of machine learning algorithm like we'll see in there used very widely today um, and form the basis of a lot of the technology that we interact with. But there are um, lots of other kinds of machine learning algorithms as well. And you'll talk about some of those in the course. Um, so this is a selected history. Um, it's focused on neural networks. It's it's also you know totally incomplete. There are other important discoveries and developments um, and people that I don't have time to mention here. So just keeping that in mind. Um, and then something uh, you know, to kind of keep in mind as we go through this history is also just how computers work. So computers generally take some kind of input uh, and programmatically produce outputs. And these inputs and outputs have to be uh, at least currently numerical in some way um, because computers operate in, in binary. So we have to be able to encode the inputs and outputs that we want to um, work with in numerically. So that kind of shapes how we think about the history of technological development and the ways that machine learning um, and AI have developed. So um, kind of keeping that in mind, before I get started with the uh, real history, I kind of have some questions um, to consider um, before we dive into this. So like, what is intelligence? Um, how would you define that? What do you think artificial intelligence means? Um, how could we determine if a system, if a computer is intelligent? Um, and then based on kind of what we know about how computers work, um, that we have to represent data numerically, they programmatically kind of produce outputs. How could we use computers to solve what we consider intelligence-based tasks? So um, I'll have these kind of questions like, um, throughout the talk. So um, feel free to share thoughts in the chat um, and or just kind of, you know, think about these um, to yourself to kind of frame the um, discussion. So I'll pause uh, for a second to see if there are any, anyone wants to share thoughts in the um, in the chat about how we might define intelligence or artificial intelligence. Yeah, I see recognizing patterns. Um, intelligence would be the ability to make a correct choice by considering the scenario. Yeah, I really like that. Um, yeah, awesome. Feel free to yeah continue to share thoughts. I love seeing. Um, uh, I love seeing uh, y'all's insight, and I always learn a lot from um, from this. Intelligence is hard to define because there's different types of intelligence according to psychology, totally. And we'll see that, um, how that plays into like how we evaluate these systems um, as we keep going in the lecture. Um, is Skynet an appropriate response? Skynet is definitely an example of, of AI. Um, luckily, we have not actually built something like that in real life yet. So, um, but that is definitely an example of AI. The ability to retain and apply information. I think that's a great definition of intelligence. Uh, memory and decision-making, um, formulate complex thoughts from information, recognize past mistakes and make better decisions off of this. Yeah, really, really awesome answers, everyone. Um, and I think I think they're all correct. Um, and you'll I think we'll kind of see how uh, these play into like how we design these kind of systems um, as we keep going. So yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I always learn a lot from asking these kind of questions in, in my classes. So thank you. All right, so let's dive into some history. Um, so I'm starting way back um, in the 1600s with uh, something called the mechanical adder, which was one of the first efforts by people to really automate um, data processing. So it used a system of gears and wheels um, to do addition and subtraction of small numbers, and you could um, also multiply and divide by just repeating those addition and subtraction functions. Um, and as I go through this history, I've kind of highlighted some of the different backgrounds of the people um, that were involved in, in developing these different technologies to kind of emphasize how many different perspectives were really required um, to get us to the point that we're at in machine learning and AI now. So 
And this particular mechanical adder was invented by uh, Blaise Pascal, who was a mathematician and a philosopher. And it was uh, an effort to reduce the human effort necessary um, to uh, for tax supervision um, that tax collectors had to do. So they wanted to make it easier um, for, for those people to do their job, which is uh, one of the main motivations for developing uh, AI in the first place. And we'll, we'll kind of see that theme repeated um, throughout the history that I go over. Um, so the next kind of key innovation um, was uh, the first example of kind of data storage. Um, so you might not think, you know, a, a loom um, to weave fabric uh, has to do with the history of AI, but we generally consider this Jacquard's loom um, invented by Joseph Maria Jacquard, who is a weaver, um, as one of the first examples of data storage. So this system used metal punch cards, which you can see here in this image, to actually position, physically position the threads. And then a collection of these cards would code a program that directed the loom. And this was one of the first systems that enabled consistent results uh, to be repeated over and over again. And this punch card system was actually used as a way of inputting data to a lot of computing systems, even into the 1900s, the late 1900s. Um, punch cards have been a, a very common uh, data storage method. So this was a very important innovation in kind of the history of computing. Um, then continuing through the 1800s, we have um, the invention of Boolean logic, uh, which was really key uh, to developing uh, modern computers. So Boolean logic represents logical and true false reasoning with these things called Boolean operators, uh, and, or, or nor. Um, and so these form the basis of how computers operate. So and, um, combines things. So if both uh, both inputs are true, then the output will be true. If uh, one of them is false, the output will be false. Or, sorry, or is, um, if uh, either one of the inputs is true, the output will be true, and then uh, not um, just negates the input. So these are really simple logical functions that can be represented in binary zero or one, uh, and they form the foundation of how modern computers operate uh, today. And they were uh, invented by George Boole, who they're named after, who was a, a mathematician and a philosopher. Um, and then later on in the night in the 1800s, um, we see the development of more uh, mechanical statistical systems. Um, uh, so kind of uh, an advanced uh, version of that uh, mechanical adder that we saw um, previously. So it combined that punch card technology from the loom um, with mechanical calculator technology to do rapid um, statistics. And this was really the beginning or considered the beginning of kind of the data processing industry where you could store data sets and then kind of automatically perform different types of computations on them. And this was again developed in an effort to make some data intensive um, systems easier for humans. So this was uh, developed in part to help with um, census data processing um, because I think, uh, I forget which census it was, but it took like eight years uh, to process the data from uh, the US census before this kind of machine was invented. Um, so almost the entire period between one census and the next census in the US was just spent processing the data. Um, so that really motivated uh, the development of this kind of system. Uh, so another uh, really key uh, um, event in the development of, um, of AI was um, uh, World War I and World War II, uh, which really spurred a lot of interest in, in uh, computing and enabled uh, different technological advances. So particularly cryptography um, or code breaking was a really key research area um, during uh, World War II in particular. 
And this was, again, a very uh, mathematically uh, complex process that involved a lot of different calculations. It was very difficult or, or impossible to do by hand. Um, so it inspired a lot of um, computer system development, uh, again, to try to ease those kind of calculations and um, uh, make it easier for humans to, to work on this task. Um, this inspired a lot of technological innovation as well to kind of support these systems. Um, so uh, vacuum tubes um, uh, form the basis of the first kind of modern computing systems. And then we transition to other types of technology um, like transistors, which are still uh, kind of the basis of computing hardware today. Um, and uh, kind of throughout this um, develop really uh, period of really rapid development in both the hardware and the software. Um, this kind of spurred uh, interest uh, more broadly in creating machines that could try to emulate human intelligence. Uh, so another key thing that was kind of happening at the same time was um, different types of scientists were starting to develop more mathematical models of how human cognition works. So um, when we're kind of thinking about the history of machine learning and AI, we tend to mention two really key innovations. So first is this guy, Walter Pitts, who was a logician, and uh, Warren McCullough, who was a neuroscientist developed a mathematical theory of how individual neurons uh, in the brain might operate. So um, an example of, of the, their model of the neuron is up here, where it takes uh, some set of inputs, um, which could be external stimuli or, or messages from other neurons. Um, they're kind of processed through mathematical functions to produce a binary um, output that would be passed along to kind of tell the person what to do. Um, and they proposed a combination of mathematics and then algorithmic decision making that they thought would be able to, to mimic human thought processes. So this was totally theoretical. They didn't implement it in, in any kind of computing system, but it kind of laid the mathematical foundation um, for modern uh, machine learning, as we'll see. And then similarly, uh, in 1949, um, Donald Hebb, uh, who is a psychologist, um, published this book, The Organization of Behavior, which is uh, one of the uh, kind of important foundational texts in, in machine learning and artificial intelligence that kind of introduced, again, theories mathematical theories of how behavior emerged from um, neuron excitement and message passing and brain structure. So how these kind of um, neuron, individual neurons that uh, Pitts and McCullough uh, modeled could be used together to give rise to more complex behavior um, and uh, they could communicate with each other. So I see a question. Um, essentially, it was at this point when it really gave the computer a sort of brain, correct? Um, yeah, so I would say we're not quite there yet. This is still kind of laying the foundation um, for that. So we're just right now starting to model mathematically human cognition, and we haven't necessarily put that into a computer yet. But yeah, great question. Um, Great, and yeah, feel free to uh, continue asking um, questions in the chat. Um, thanks for that. All right, so we have um, uh, we have oops, sorry, we have a lot of techno technological um, innovation in terms of, of computers and, and algorithms. We have we're starting to develop a mathematical model of, of cognition. Um, and uh, yeah, these things combined, um, oops, sorry, going the wrong way, uh, started laying the foundation for, for what we consider machine learning today. So another really important um, innovation that happened along the same time was something called the Turing test. Um, so Alan Turing, who is a mathematician, was really key in some of those efforts I mentioned during World War II to um, help with code breaking. And he uh, really predicted the development of, of kind of modern machine learning in 1947. Um, and that 
you know, eventually um, computers that, that tried to mimic human behavior would become really ubiquitous um, and have a big impact uh, on the world. And he even predicted how it would kind of affect industry and different things. So he developed this thing that we refer to as the Turing test, but he um, actually called the imitation game, which is a method to uh, determine if a computer system has human-like intelligence or not. Um, so the way this test happens is there's a human questioner um, and then there are uh, two respondents, a machine respondent and a human respondent. And if the questioner cannot determine after some fixed period of time, uh, people often talk about five to, five to 10 minutes, um, if the, uh, after that time has elapsed, if the questioner can't determine which of the respondents is a computer and which is a human, then it's said that the uh, computer has passed the Turing test and, and we would consider that an intelligent system. Um, so, so far there's been only one uh, rather controversial um, program that's been considered to pass the Turing test. Um, and it was a really interesting example. It was a chat bot that um, posed as a 13 year old Ukrainian boy who spoke English as a second language. Um, so this uh, introduces some really interesting ideas um, about, you know, he's po it, the chatbot is posing as a young uh, person who speaks English as a second language, meaning that you would expect it to make some errors. So it kind of bakes uh, its imperfections into uh, the kind of persona that it's taking on. So if it makes mistakes, you could attribute it to, uh, to some like real world factors that maybe English is the second language or things like that. So that's why it's a bit controversial that um, people say that this bot passed the Turing test, um, but it kind of shows some interesting uh, components of the Turing test itself and, and maybe some of its limitations in evaluating what intelligence means. Yeah, I see a question. Um, it's not really concrete um, or it's subjective. Yeah, exactly. So it's really uh, just evaluating if you can trick, if a machine can trick a human into thinking that it's a human. So it's absolutely subjective. Um, um, and, you know, you can kind of get around that a bit by having multiple people do it, um, you know, so it has to uh, trick people the majority of the time or something, but yes, it is subjective. Um, and this is, yes, I see two questions about like, now we get asked on websites if we are human. So yeah, it's, it's kind of similar. So that is um, generally done because you can really, uh, you, a, a lot of people can run programs now that just like automatically interact with websites. So this can be used, people use it a lot to like buy tickets for a really popular event um, automatically or to uh, do web scraping or different kinds of things. So that's often why we, um, why we get uh, those are you a human questions on websites to uh, try to prevent kind of automated behavior like that. Um, Uh, so it was human assigned. Um, sorry, the, there was a question of, of if the computer chose, um, if the computer chose the persona or it was uh, designed. So yes, the system designers chose the persona. Um, so again, that's part of kind of the controversy um, of, of this passing the Turing test. Like some people disagree that it passed the Turing test because right, the, the machine didn't decide this is the way that I'm gonna trick people. It was, it was set up by um, humans. Um, and, sorry, just checking questions. So yeah, great, this is a great point. Humans accuracy isn't a hundred percent also. Yeah, so that is, I think a really interesting kind of facet of the Turing test is, um, is right, human behavior isn't perfect, human intelligence isn't perfect. So uh, does that kind of bake error into our evaluation 
of intelligent systems um, and what kind of limits does that pose? Like, do we really want to build uh, machine systems that are imperfect if we could have it do a task perfectly instead? Like, does it make sense to base our uh, definition of intelligence on human behavior or is there kind of a broader definition that we could come up with? Yeah, so I think the Turing test is a really interesting uh, a really interesting way of evaluating these systems that you know is not the end all be all like it is a very famous evaluation metric and people a lot of researchers do try to build systems um specifically to pass the turing test but i think what we're seeing from a lot of these questions is that it is limited and there may be other ways of evaluating intelligence as well um all right i'm going to keep going for now, but please, yeah, keep asking questions um, in the chat. Um, all right, so kind of post-World War II uh, in the 1950s and beyond, we start to see um, ways of using these kind of hardware innovations that we've had and these computing innovations that we've had um, to build intelligent systems in different ways. So a really common um, one that was used uh, was something called symbolic approaches and symbolic AI kind of has two key components. There's a logic component that is um, all uh, hand-coded um, that specifies a knowledge base based on human intelligence that could be used in problem solving. Um, so this could be a set of like rules that humans know. Um, it could define the space of um, solutions that are allowed based on, on some kind of expert knowledge. Knowledge. And then there's a control component that determines how to uh, make inferences and solve problems using that knowledge base that we've um, hand coded. And so a really famous example of uh, people using symbolic AI in really uh, impressive ways is in 1953, Arthur Samuel um, used symbolic AI to play championship level checkers. So he actually coded a computer um, that could play checkers very well. And it um, worked with the symbolic AI approach. So um, he defined the space of possible moves um, based on the, the structure of the board um, and uh, the way that checkers are allowed to move, how many pieces start out, all of those things. So he encoded all of that by hand. That was a logic component. And then it kind of used this pruning structure um, to determine the chances of winning uh, with each possible move. So based on the configuration of the board um, at the time that it was going to make Peter's biggest move, and based on those rules that Arthur had given it about how this works, um, look at the base of probability of winning and then and what to do based on the the highest probability of winning and this is widely considered um, the first example of a real learning program um all right sorry i'm lagging uh i don't uh yeah right. i think it's you're my all right right now okay um so yes this is a uh, widely considered like the first uh example of a real computer learning program um so yes it's kind of a decision tree exactly um all right uh awesome um, so another kind of key event that happened in this post-World War II era uh, was this Dartmouth workshop. So like I mentioned, um, World War II and the surrounding efforts really prompted a lot of interest in uh, intelligent machines. Um, and so in 1956, there was this really famous um, workshop that brought together um, different mathematicians, scientists, and engineers um, for two months to kind of explore the mathematical foundations of intelligence and how we could design computer systems to try to um, mimic that intelligence. And this is considered kind of the birthplace of AI, artificial intelligence, as a field of study. Um, they you know, say that uh, the, the work 
the kind of phrase artificial intelligence was really coined um, at, at this uh, workshop. So it's kind of the birthplace of, of this as an academic field of study. Um, and their efforts here were really based on this uh, conjecture that I find very interesting, um, that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So I find this really interesting uh, because even today in you know 2022, we don't have a mathematical model of our own cognition yet. You know, we kind of we have some idea how the brain works. We have those mathematical models of neurons that we talked about. We have, you know, kind of brain mapping um, from MRIs and different kinds of things. But this was really a kind of big statement to make in the 50s. We automatically describe every fascinating, um, like that's a, that's a big, a big statement um, that they didn't necessarily have it up with, but that kind of uh, framed how we think about uh, AI and machine learning as a field. To kind of define themes that would guide the field moving forward. Um, so things like um, wanting systems to do language processing, a focus on neural networks, so um, uh, computations, uh, based on the way the human brain works, uh, the need for abstraction and creativity and in truly intelligent systems, and lots of other themes that would really kind of define uh, the way people approach this work in the future. Um, all right, so again, kind of at the same time, um, you know, a bit after this workshop and, and in the 60s, um, we had some really key algorithmic developments. Um, so uh, called perceptrons, which really formed the basis of um, modern neural networks. So perceptrons were a type of algorithm that combined um, Hebb's model of neural cognition systems that we talked about, that mathematical model of, of brain neurons, with um, Arthur Samuels and other work on symbolic AI to create a neuron-based learning model. So each um, neuron in this model, which mimics um, human brain neurons, has adjustable parameters. Um, so it has um, these different weights, uh, Ws up here. So you would have a piece of information coming in. They would be modified by some weights. And then that would um, uh, uh, determine the output of the neuron. Um, so a similar structure to how human neurons work, but all of these parameters were uh, are adjustable. And learning or training the neuron is the process of adjusting those parameters um, to a certain uh, task and data set. To, so to help this neuron um, work with certain types of data to do a certain task. Um, so generally, and percept, so this is an individual uh, they are to uh, There is a little bit of a disruption again. Sorry for the interruption. Um, Uh, Savannah, there was a bit of a lag here for the past like 20 seconds. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I was going to say. Uh, sorry for the disruption, guys. I think Savannah will be back in a moment. Uh, hey, you're, I think you're muted. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me try turning off my camera, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe we can do that. Thank you. Um, all right, so these, these neurons, these mathematical... Um, I believe your the slides are not There you go. Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> okay, so these um, mathematical neurons um, can be um, grouped together into um, <clears throat> into layers. So you can have multiple adjustable neurons, and then you can also stack those layers together, which is kind of what's shown in this um, second diagram down here. So you have um, an input layer uh, where data is first processed through um, those neurons produce an output, which is passed on to the next set of neurons, and that can continue on to, to produce the final output um, for your task. So generally, perceptrons um, as a network aim to learn a function that maps your inputs, which are the features of your data set, to outputs, which are some type of predictions. Um, so, you know, a simple example could be um, if I have data about a plant, uh, like I have maybe the height of the plant, uh, the number of leaves that it has, uh, and the length of its roots, some different set of features, um, I could process that through a perceptron to, um, I don't know, predict the type of plant that it is. So if I'm trying to distinguish between, you know, three different types of plants, my input would be those features of the plant and my output would be what type of plant it is. And so the goal of the um, perceptron network um, would be uh, to learn a function uh, that maps those input features to output features um, by uh, approximating that function with these adjustable weights. So we try to vary those weights so that this whole network um, starts to approximate that true function that uh, maps plant features to plant uh, classification. So we saw really key innovations in, in developing um, these perceptrons in the 50s and 60s. So the first kind of single layer functional perceptron was invented um, by Frank Rosenblatt, a psychologist in 1957. It was only a single layer, so it could only learn a very small set of functions, and particularly it could only learn linear functions because it only had um, one set of weights, so it could only transform um, the input data linearly. Um, the next innovation was in 1965, where these two mathematicians developed a multi-layer perceptron um, that could um, learn more complex functions. So instead of just learning linear transformations, it could learn um, more uh, difficult transformations. Um, so it could solve a wider class of problems. And they also developed a method to uh, start to tune these weights effectively um, instead uh, to, to approximate different types of, of uh, functions. Um, so, uh, we, we had these examples of, of perceptrons or neural networks, um, but during the kind of rest of the 1900s, they were still kind of one-off successes. It was hard to build very large networks um, and it was hard to know how to adjust the weights. So it was really kind of limited in the types of functions that those perceptrons or neural networks could approximate. So they couldn't be applied to that many types of problems. So there were um, different efforts to try to um, build intelligent systems in other ways. Um, so there were developments of different pattern recognition algorithms um, that compared new data points um, or samples to existing data. For example, the nearest neighbor models, um, which is what's shown in this diagram up here, where if you're given a new piece of data, you look at the other pieces of data that are closest to it and use that to determine um, the, what label you'll give this new piece of data. So if we were trying to classify this green circle, we would look at like what's nearest to it. So if we consider um, the three nearest neighbors, we have two triangles and one square. So we would, in that case, give the uh, green circle a triangle label. But if we considered more neighbors going out farther, um, you know, we then would have three squares and two triangles, so we might give it a label of a square. So developing different kinds of algorithms to do like automated data labeling, um, to learn about data distributions, 
Um, continuing that kind of symbolic or um, AI approach with the kind of expert systems. So for example, um, developing chatbots with like fixed vocabulary that you um, uh, encoded beforehand and it would kind of just um, give the appropriate response based on keyword detection. Um, Explanation-based learning, uh, which tried to, um, again, it relied on these specified domain rules um, and tried to uh, discard non-relevant data to limit the function space um, that it was looking over. So this was a way that um, people kind of took the symbolic approach that Arthur Samuels used for playing checkers and applied it to a more complicated system like playing chess, where there's a lot more moves you could make. So you need some way to limit the space of moves that it's evaluating the probability over. Um, and then there were some, um, you know, more examples of, of successful neural networks for very specific tasks. So, um, for example, this net talk algorithm um, kind of learned to speak English um, by learning to map words um, to phonetic sounds. Um, so you could feed it a string of letters and it would uh, try to predict how it would sound phonetically based on um, other examples that had been shown. Um, but so there were a lot, there was different work going on, a lot of different approaches, um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, hugely successful um, until there was some- Sorry, th there is one question from the audience. Um, on. Uh, okay, so for explanation-based learning, the way of thinking when playing chess is almost identical to the programmer uh, themselves. Um, uh, well, I would, I guess it's, a, I, I don't know how people play chess, I guess. Um, so I, I guess we would have to ask an expert chess player, but I guess uh, probably kind of like you think through possible moves you can make and try to um, evaluate the probability of, of winning. Um, the reason that um, machines are often more powerful uh, than human players is that they can really evaluate the full space of, uh, of possible moves. So maybe there's some that a human chess player wouldn't come up with um, that are just like really uh, kind of rare moves, but uh, could have a big chance of winning that a human player might not come up with. So that's kind of why um, uh, machines can um, do a better job because they're able to evaluate like the very full space. Um, all right, so in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, there were some really key uh, innovations in optimization methods um, that were used to, uh, that, that helped us use neural networks more efficiently to start to solve more types of problems. So in particular, I highlight two really important ones here. So backpropagation um, is the algorithm that is you, uh, that was developed to use training, er training errors um, to project progressively adjust neuron weights and improve the model fit. So you would send a piece of data through your neural network, um, have it processed through all those um, parameters and your hidden layers, get some uh, output prediction, compare that to the truth value, and then progressively um, use those errors to adjust first the uh, first hidden layer, and then uh, the next hidden layer and so on back through to the beginning of the network. And then in the late 90s, there were, oops, um, there was a big innovation in gradient-based learning, um, which was basically a way that you can effectively do this back propagation um, on computers. So it made it easier to uh, do the calculations uh, to uh, know how much to adjust to the weights of those hidden layers. Um, so the combination of these two innovations, along with increasing increases in computing power and data storage, having more memory available, more processing power, greatly expanded the space of functions that neural networks um, could learn. So this is what really enabled the 
kind of current state of uh, machine learning that we have right now. So in the 2000s, we've really seen a, a extremely rapid growth and particularly even in the last five to 10 years um, of neural network based machine learning. So now we've seen neural networks applied successfully to a ton of different problem spaces, um, to image processing, to sequence data, even generating um, new types of data. And we'll talk about these, uh, you'll, you'll learn about some of these different um, neural networks uh, in more detail throughout the rest of the class. Um, but this really uh, opens the really opened up the power of neural networks um, and uh, made machine learning into the very like popular field that it is today. Um, along with another one more key innovation that I'll mention is kind of the availability of GPUs, um, which enable really deep models. So tons and tons of layers in that neural network um, and allows those to be efficiently trained. And today machine learning is used um, across almost all domains. I've listed a bunch of examples here, cancer detection, playing games, spatial recognition, generating text, um, search and news feed curation, decision-making, trend forecasting, all kinds of different things. There's many, many more. Um, so this is a really uh, now powerful technology. Um, what's the fundamental difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? Um, Great question. Uh, so I talk about that in a few slides, but I can go ahead and, and answer it now. So artificial intelligence is uh, a bit broader than machine learning. So machine learning is uh, kind of this approach of finding patterns in data sets uh, without those patterns having to be explicitly stated. Um, so it's a certain way of encoding intelligence into computers, but artificial intelligence encompasses a lot more uh, than just that. So it could include things like actually designing the robotics, um, so uh, developing sensors that can take in visual information in real time, um, things like that. So it's not just the like machine learning neural network part. Um, Great question. Um, how much faster can artificial neural networks process data than our own brains? Um, so, uh, so that's an interesting question. So I wouldn't say that it can necessarily process data faster, like. We can make inference. It, it depends on on the task. Like humans can make inferences very quickly once we know how to do something. So like once you know what a cat looks like, you kind of instantly recognize when you see a new cat that it's a cat. Um, but kind of the advantage of machine learning is that it can, in some cases, learn more quickly um, than humans. So in particular, with really big data sets where we don't necessarily know the patterns that we're looking for in those data sets, that's really where machine learning can kind of outperform humans. Um, so things like the playing chess example we talked about, you know, we can't necessarily compute the phase space of all possible chess moves, whereas a computer can. So it's kind of certain tasks uh, and things where it really outperforms um, humans. Um, so we will talk about uh, the training process uh, for machine learning models in a, in a few minutes. So thanks for that question. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to do a quick interlude with some more kind of brainstorming um, questions um, uh, before we kind of go on to some of the basics of, of machine learning. Um, so some of these we kind of already talked about, like, does it make sense to base our evaluation of artificial intelligence on how we understand human intelligence? Are there other ways we could do that evaluation? Um, does it make sense that we have based pretty much all of our modern machine learning algorithms on the physical structure of the brain, like trying to mimic these actual neurons in the human brain and, and do that with a computer? Um, if a system can solve a really complex problem, but we don't understand how it solved it, do we still consider that intelligent? Um, and then we, we talked about this a bit, our errors or imperfections 
perfections, essential to human-like cognition. Um, how does this relate to the Turing test? Is that a really good evaluation of intelligence um, or not? So um, yeah, I would love to hear any thoughts on those questions. Um, yeah, so the brain is full of neural pathways. So that's how we base our algorithms. The more we understand the human brain, the more accurate our models get. Yeah, so I mean, that's a possibility, I think is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, it is, yeah, absolutely. Maybe we understand more about the brain, we're better to build uh, better neural based models, but perhaps there's other ways that we can model data as well. Um, you know, that's not based on, on how the human brain works. You know, there's other types of, of intelligence um, in the world, you know, uh, different types of animals have different kind of visual pathways. Um, they can take in different types of information than we can. Um, so it's possible that, you know, there's other types of ways of designing intelligence systems um, as well. Um, could be a good baseline to work from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it has been a good baseline to work from so far. Absolutely. We've seen neural networks can be can be extremely powerful. Um, errors and imperfections created by AI are usually man-made errors or errors that are programmed to happen with the AI. Um, AI can't make those kind of mistakes genuinely. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And, and we'll see that come up again. Um, when we talk about kind of bias in, in AI systems and, and other types of mistakes that it can make. Yeah, it is often because it's uh, just copying what humans do. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, it makes sense to base machine learning on the brain as the brain can store a lot of data, but these algorithms can go through them faster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are we Far, too far from making AI that's able to analyze and improve other AIs. Yeah, so there's some really interesting work um, happening in that space right now of, uh, you know, write, developing AIs that can write code um, that uh, actually runs on computers. Um, it's not, uh, it's not super uh, effective yet, but that's definitely a space of, of research. Yeah, awesome. Thanks guys, I'm gonna uh, continue going just in the interest of time, um, but really awesome questions and insights. Um, all right, so I'm gonna just uh, talk about a couple uh, kind of key uh, foundations of, of how we do modern machine learning and you'll hear more about these in the future lectures. Uh, but all right, kind of just to give a def us a definition of machine learning, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different ways that people kind of define it that are pretty similar. The one that I tend to use is this, this one in bold, um, using to statistics to find patterns in large data sets without those patterns having to be explicitly stated. Um, so this emphasizes um, the need for data in machine learning. We can't have machine learning without data, at least in our current uh, the current way that we do machine learning. Um, and then it highlights that, um, you know, the kind of key innovation and the exciting thing about machine learning is that we don't have to tell the computer exactly what to do. It can adjust itself based on the data that we show it. So, um, yeah, we talked about this a bit already, but a lot of uh, modern day machine learning is neural network based. Um, particularly, there's been a focus on uh, what we call deep networks with lots of layers. You might have heard um, the phrase deep learning. So this is a nice diagram that kind of describes how these fields fit together. So like we mentioned, artificial intelligence is kind of this big bubble um, that encompasses both machine learning, but also uh, lots of other things like robotics um, and, and other kind of aspects of intelligence. Deep learning is then, again, a subfield of machine learning um, that's very powerful and has been the focus of a lot of research recently, um, but there are you know, lots of other algorithms in machine learning. And then data science kind of intersects with those three areas um, because like I mentioned, we need data to train machine learning models. But again, there's things you can do with data. There's types of data science that are not machine learning, you know, deterministic models, um, statistics um, that are not necessarily machine learning based. And then big data 
kind of intersects deep learning and data science in particular, because uh, generally the bigger, the deeper your models are, the more data you need to train them because you have more parameters that you have to learn. Um, so you need more examples to help effectively um, adjust those parameters. Um, so, right, a lot of the most powerful algorithms that we, we have today require extremely large data sets to train. This can raise, um, you know, concerns around data collection. How do we get that data? How do we store it? How do we determine what it's used for? How do we make sure that uh, the data is robust? It doesn't change over time, things like that. Um, and then I also want to highlight that machine learning really intersects with a lot of other fields. Um, there's just there's some examples down here, um, scientific machine learning. Um, so using machine learning in, in science and engineering, language processing, computational health, robotics, um, privacy and ethics. Um, so we really need people of all types of backgrounds um, uh, both, uh, you know, life backgrounds and academic backgrounds um, to continue to innovate in this field and to make sure we do that innovation responsibly. Um, so here are just some examples um, of types of problems that we can solve with machine learning. Um, so the kind of, the probably two most common ones that we talk about are classification and regression. So classification is where we're trying to predict a class label um, for an input. So an example is um, spam detection. So your input would be uh, the text of an email and maybe, um, you know, who sent it, when they sent it, things like that. And the uh, machine learning model would predict uh, a label, uh, either it's not, it's spam or it's not spam. And that would determine, you know, where your email um, server uh, puts the message. Regression is the other probably most common type of problem we do with machine learning, where instead of predicting a specific label, we're just predicting a continuous variable. So the example I have here is uh, predicting home price. So you have features about a house, maybe like the number of bedrooms, the age of the home, the school district, things like that. And your machine learning model would predict um, the selling price. There's also lots of other things we can do with machine learning. We can do clustering where we just try to group similar inputs together without giving them a label or a prediction. Um, we can generate new data based on some pattern that the algorithm has learned about. Um, we can uh, identify common rules and associations um, in data. We can rank and order data. Um, based on um, how users interact with it. We can try to detect anomalies or um, uh, abnormal behavior in data distributions, again, uh, by learning about uh, yeah, the distributions and the pattern in the data. And we can also uh, learn new representations of data that can help us do other tasks better. So the kind of underlying thing for all of these different applications is that we need to learn about the distribution of the data that, that the algorithm is shown. And then the um, information that it learns about that data distribution can be learned to do, sorry, can be used to do all different kinds of tasks. Um, and then I want to just briefly mention, um, we kind of, I think this course is generally focused on supervised machine learning. Um, so we talk about uh, two different kinds of machine learning pretty often. So there's supervised learning where the model is provided with labels and the algorithm tries to learn the relationship between the input features and those labels during training. So that's the way that neural networks work. Um, where we're, um, uh, we're using that neural network structure to, to do classification or regression or other types of tasks. Um, but there's also unsupervised learning where you don't have any labels or classification, and you're just trying to learn about patterns that exist in the data. You're not saying um, what specifically you want, need to use those patterns to do, you're just interested in the structure of your data. Um, there's also uh, reinforcement learning, uh, which is another type of, of machine learning um, where models are, are rewarded for meeting goals. Um, but I believe the focus of, of, um, of this course is, is primarily supervised learning. 
Um, so how do you reward a model? So basically you, you just write a mathematical function um, that will become like more positive uh, if the model behaves the way you want it to and more negative if it doesn't. So this can be used to do things like uh, training a robot to walk um, through uh, some uh, some like course with objects in the way or something. So the reward function would become more positive the closer the robot gets to like the finish line and it would become more negative uh, as it uh, is farther away from the finish line. And so it learns a behavior to like navigate the course to try to maximize the reward function. That's a very simple example, um, but that's kind of how, how that works. Um, Uh, a couple other questions. Gmail grouping emails into primary social marketing, et cetera, is machine learning? Yes, absolutely. Um, so machine learning, I am sure that you've interacted with machine learning algorithms like at least five times already today. Pretty much every piece of technology that we interact with has machine learning uh, underscoring it. Um, and then uh, is this how companies like Facebook predict the personality and traits of their users through data. So that's a really interesting question. Um, this is how they do that, uh, yes, but they're not actually, um, they're, so the, sorry, I'm trying to think about how to answer this question. Um, I, re I really like this question because they're not actually predicting personality traits. Um, we, we don't have a like machine learning model that, that can do that because we don't have a mathematical model of personality traits um, and they don't have like truth information. So they might uh, predict something that they say is like a personality trait, uh, but really it's, it's just an approximation of that. So Facebook like cannot actually learn about you you know, in a real sense, because we don't have a mathematical model of those things. So like there's been some work where people try to, where like people say they build an algorithm to like determine someone's trustworthiness. But in reality, we don't have a way of mathematically measuring trustworthiness. So you're approximating something that we've decided is like a proxy for trustworthiness. Uh, but it's not, it's not actually that. So yeah, really interesting question. This is the kind of algorithms that they would use to do that. But I think it's important to consider like what, what the limitations of machine learning are. Um, how do we choose between different machine learning algorithms? So we'll see, uh, you know, in, in the rest of this talk and in the rest of the week, different algorithms tend to be suited for different types of data and different um, types of problems. Um, so that can help you decide which ones to use. Um, cable companies use machine learning for digital media advertising, cable trafficking. Yeah, so um, advertising uses a ton of machine learning and data science to try to um, show uh, ads to the people who are most likely to buy a certain uh, item. Um, ad targeting is a huge area of, of machine learning applications. Um, also, yeah, web traffic routing is another one. Um, how often do we use Gaussian distribution or normal distribution in AI and machine learning? Um, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. Um, we, we try to learn about different distributions of data. And in some cases, we, we assume that data follows a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. Um, but we also try to learn uh, when it varies from that. Um, awesome. And uh, let's see, going back to the questions posed before, I think a caveat of modeling AI of human behavior and intelligence is just as humans have societal preconceptions and bias, we can also end up training AI models with biased data. How do we ensure that we use machine learning and AI models without bias? Great question. And uh, yes, I have some slides on this later on. Um, this is absolutely a huge concern. And we have seen repeatedly that this is exactly what happens if we train um, 
machines to just mimic human behavior because humans are biased and we see those biases reproduced and scaled up. And there are different ways um, to address this. And, and I'll talk about some of those hopefully in this talk. There's also a great talk from Emily Denton on Friday, where she'll dive into a lot more of these issues, but you are absolutely spot on um, that that kind of behavior happens a lot. Um, awesome. All right, I'll keep going. So the way that we actually do this in the supervised learning case is we have our training data set um, with a bunch of examples um, of your uh, input features. Uh, uh, so each of your training examples would have the same uh, features and you would have you have a bunch of examples. You choose whatever model you're gonna use um, and then you optimize the parameters of that model uh, to fit your training data. Uh, in the case of neural networks, we do that using those backpropagation and gradient descent algorithms that I mentioned. And, and I think you'll talk more about how those work mathematically in, in some future lectures. And then you use that model to make an inference by um, sending a new piece of data through your trained and adjusted model and um, seeing what prediction it makes from your new piece of data. Um, and how do we evaluate these models? So typically the first thing that we look at is model accuracy. So just the percentage of correctly predicted samples, um, but other behaviors matter as well. So things like the number of true and false positives and negatives um, can be really important. You know, maybe you care about, um, you know, misclassify or uh, maybe you care about, um, yeah, false negatives more than false positives. You care about certain kind of error more than others. Um, you know, if we're trying to uh, detect a disease um, that's highly contagious, maybe we care more about uh, not uh, missing any cases of the disease than we do about telling people who uh, don't have the, who are healthy that they have the disease. You know, different types of errors can matter more in different situations. Um, performance across classes is also important. Maybe, um, you know, if we're trying to um, uh, identify different types of dog, or uh, yeah, we're trying to uh, identify different types of animals um, and our model works really well on uh, cats and dogs, but not on fish. Um, all of the errors that it throws are on fish. Um, that's important to know. Um, stability, does your model work well over time? Does it degrade? Um, is it robust to uh, small adjustments in your input data? Things like that are all really important to consider. Um, and then um, one thing that I wanna highlight is to make sure a model will generalize well to new samples. We typically do something called, called a test train split where you use only a portion of your data, the training set, um, to do that uh, model parameter adjustment um, and training. And then you evaluate the performance on, an, on the other subset of your data, the test set. Um, and if your data performs well on your training set and whoops, poorly on your test set, um, then you know that your model is not gonna work when you deploy it. It's not gonna generalize well. It's learned things that are only in your training data set uh, and don't generalize. So we can kind of see an intuitive example of what that looks like over here. So in the case of underfitting, where our model hasn't learned enough, um, maybe we're trying to separate these uh, circles from squares. Um, and it's just learned a flat line that doesn't do any kind of separation. So that's uh, called underfitting. Um, and we can see this is a, a loss function plot. So this is showing kind of the error of our model. So in this kind of underfitted regime where it hasn't learned anything, we can see the error is pretty large. And then as our error starts to decrease, we would say probably our optimal solution is around this area where we have um, a pretty low error rate, um, but so sorry, the uh, training set accuracy is these orange dots and the test set accuracy is these uh, blue or gray dots. So it's before we start seeing a um, divergence in the uh, training and test set. So this might be a good solution where we do see 
the function it's learning is, oh, this is, sorry, I messed up the, these functions are actually incorrect. Sorry, this slide is a little messed up. Um, this is actually the overtrained function um, where it's learned a very kind of convoluted um, function to, to specifically hit all of the black dots. But if we added a new piece of data um, that's slightly different, uh, the classification function might not work anymore because it's just memorized specifically these examples that it's showing. So this is, yeah, sorry about the mistake here. I'll fix that before I upload the slides. Um, but right, we can check for overfitting by kind of seeing how uh, the training and test set performance diverges. Um, I'm gonna skip this demo um, since I'm running low on time, um, but I, uh, when the slides are uploaded, you can go to this link or um, just remember TensorFlow Playground. Um, and it's a really cool kind of intuitive example where you can, uh, without any coding, um, adjust different uh, neural network designs and see how they work on different data sets and kind of get a sense of how that training um, and parameter optimization happens. Um, and I see a question, do all models have to be created from scratch or are there models that already exist for specific contexts? Um, great question. So there are, um, yeah, there are a lot of models um, that are already trained, particularly for really common tasks like computer vision, um, image classification, or text processing. There are models that are kind of available already um, that you can start from and you can fine tune them a bit for a specific problem or generally they, they work well for a lot of tasks um, already. Um, yeah, great question. Um, all right. So yeah, kind of knowing um, a bit more about how machine learning works now, um, I'm interested if y'all can think of an example of machine learning that you interact with in your daily life. We've already seen some, like we talked about Gmail filters, um, but maybe think of a different example. And then you can consider, you know, do you think it's a supervised or unsupervised model? What type, type of data might have been needed to train it? What the learning objective of the model was? And maybe some important considerations during training. Um, yeah, I see a lot of great answers already. Um, Google search, translators, Facebook ads, Amazon suggestions, Uber, absolutely recommender systems. Google map routing, um, Netflix recommendations, totally awesome. So let's take one of these examples, um, maybe of like uh, recommendations. So Netflix recommendations, um, Amazon suggestions, Facebook ads, those kind of things. Um, what kind of data and model and learning objective might be used for recommendation systems like that? Yeah, previous watches, absolutely what you've uh, engaged with before. User likes, yeah, also, um, yeah, maybe demographics, things like age, browser history, totally. How long you stayed on a video, absolutely. So like user behavior and user features um, are definitely the kind of data that's used to train those. Um, any like important considerations that you might want to think about if you were building a recommender system. Privacy, yeah, great. Um, how to evaluate the results? Yeah, how do we know if it's if it's meaningful? How do we know if like that's actually what the user wanted or, or we just showed them this content? And so that's what they're engaging with because it's what we showed them. Yeah, great considerations. Awesome. So I love doing these kind of evaluations all the time. Like if I encounter, uh, you know, some kind of machine learning system out in my daily life, I love trying to take it apart like this and, and think about, you know, what data they might be using to train it, how they might have designed the system. I think this can be a really, um, yeah, interesting, interesting way to see how much impact these algorithms have on our lives. Um, awesome. 
Okay, so I have like 20 minutes left. So I'll go quickly through um, some of the rest of the slides. So next I wanted to kind of talk about two um, really popular areas of machine learning applications. And these are um, also the ones that you're kind of gonna dive deeper into as the um, week goes on. So I'll give some quick introductions here. So the first one is computer vision. So uh, computer vision is a huge subfield of machine learning, particularly like one of the um, uh, one of the applications of machine learning that I think we hear talked about a lot is like self-driving cars, um, which absolutely rely on computer vision to um, to see obstacles around them, other cars, road signs, things like that. Um, but uh, computers see images of, of giant matrices of pixel values. So for example, in this cat, um, you know, just this small section of the cat's face is, is just a ton of uh, individual RGB values for individual pixels. So, um, you know, we can kind of think about some difficulties that this type of data could uh, present for, um, for machine learning applications. So in particular, I highlight a few here. Um, so one of the biggest ones is that uh, if we use just individual pixel values um, as training features, that's a ton of features to try to learn from. Um, so that can be hard to optimize, but if we try to just do um, hand engineered features, uh, where we just like pick out specific parts of the image to focus on or things like that, that can be hard to generalize. Um, also transformation. So images, you know, if we're doing object classification, um, you know, on the left side of an image and on the right side of an image, they're both cats. Um, so we need to understand that like the same object can be translated in space or it can be rotated and still be the same uh, object. So that can also be difficult for, um, for uh, machine learning algorithms to learn. Um, and then complexity images can be very complex. There can be you know, different objects in the same image, multiple instances of the same object in an image. So these can be very uh, kind of difficult pieces of data to learn from. Um, but luckily, we have some really great innovations in computer vision um, algorithm design. And again, just like we saw with kind of how regular neural networks developed, um, researchers in some part took um, inspiration from human uh, visual biological systems. So sorry, I'm going a bit quickly here, um, but I know that you will cover this in more detail uh, in the next couple of days. And I, I want to get to kind of the last my talk as well. So sorry, I'm going a bit quickly, but um, convolutional neural networks are generally the um, algorithm that we use um, for image processing. So on just a conceptual level, because again, you'll go more into the math and details later on, um, these work by um, convolving a filter or a matrix um, across the input image to create multiple transformed representations um, of your input image, and then you use those new representations of your image as input to a standard um, just neural network like we already talked about. So you basically take one image and you learn these different filters. Um, you apply those filters to the image to get new representations of your image, and then you feed those into uh, a regular neural network. And the convolutions or filters um, can learn all different types of information from your image. And some of that information is human interpretable, like, you know, um, these uh, filters up here we can see are kind of learning like outlines, different types of depth information, um, but uh, convolutions or filters can also learn much more complex information that's maybe not human and interpretable. So as we see, you know, going on to some of the um, later filters in the neural network and the kind of deeper layers, it's learning these representations of images that, you know, mean nothing to us as humans. They kind of just look like blobs and blurs, um, but there is some relevant information in here that the computer is extracting from these filters um, that it can then feed into that final connected neural network layer um, to make some kind of prediction about the input image. 
Um, so human visual processing combines lots of different tasks um, like uh, classification, locating where an object is in an image, um, you know, and then uh, deciding what that object is. Um, so there's several difficulties that we have in really mimicking true human vision um, with artificial intelligence. Um, so in particular, you need a ton of training examples, like you need uh, an example of every type of object that the system could see. Um, you know, if you just show it examples of cats and dogs, it won't, you know, know what a bird is. So you can, uh, it can require very large data sets to train these systems. Um, there are uh, situations that humans can understand that can be very tricky for AI. So like if objects are partially concealed, um, it can be very hard for AI to, to identify what they are. It can struggle with depth um, or other types of visual distortions. Um, and also models don't have physical intuition uh, or well, in most cases, objects don't come with physical intuition that humans do where we kind of understand that the world is like three dimensional. Um, we have rotation invariance and things like that. Those do not come for free uh, with computer vision systems. We have to either show it enough examples that it learns that or we have to explicitly tell it, which is actually some of the work that I do of how we can bring physical intuition into um, machine learning algorithms. So you see a question, um, is that why there was that problem that AI was not detecting certain faces? Um, so that was actually, well, yeah, there's a couple of reasons. Um, for that, the, the kind of primary reason that we saw for that was going back to this issue of data bias that we talked about, um, where um, in training, uh, a lot of facial recognition algorithms were just shown many more examples of white male faces than any other types of faces. So it learned to do a better job on that type of data because that's what it was primarily trained on. But yeah, there also can be um, vision uh, issues that come into play in that where like our camera systems actually are designed uh, to work with different, with certain skin tones uh, better than others um, and, and things like that. So that can cause uh, yeah, issues in, in visual processing for AI as well. But primarily, I think what you're talking about was a data bias problem. Um, so computer vision uh, is really powerful though. It can be used in, in a ton of different applications. So I've highlighted just a few here. So some really, um, impactful things like detecting different types of crop disease, uh, which can help um, with uh, 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 addressing things like world hunger, um, tracking populations of elephants using satellite imagery. Um, it's also used for things like uh, disaster response. There's a lot of work using satellite imagery um, to do kind of um, different types of tracking in, in areas where it can be hard to do on the ground. Um, this down here is an example of cancer detection. So using um, MRI or other types of medical imaging, um, doing automatic cancer detection, um, which could help locate um, difficult to find cancer that, that doctors might miss. And then also just like more, um, Kind of fun things like you know knowing how to apply snapchat filters that is ai so it has to kind of detect facial landmarks uh in your image so that it knows where to apply the um filters but it can also be used for more kind of sinister things like i see someone mention crime detection um it can be used yeah for different types of surveillance um facial recognition like we mentioned um tracking um yeah different types of things so there are you know helpful uh applications kind of fun applications also potentially negative applications um yeah drone operation absolutely automated automated weapons targeting um yes this is used a lot in the military deep fakes yes deep fakes are a really interesting and very scary uh uh area of machine learning that combines computer vision with um, generation, uh, data generation. So you can actually create videos um, 
of people, um, you know, saying or doing things that they have never done. It's totally computer generated, um, but it's hyper realistic. Um, so that, yeah, there you can see um, how this opens up a whole new space of of kind of um, uh, of kind of interesting and and uh, potentially worrying applications. <clears throat> yes, so that's what deep fakes are. You can forge something. Um, that is undetectable. Um, it's uh, very difficult, or in some cases, impossible to tell deep fakes from, uh, from real video, which, yes, is very scary. Um, I'm going to skip over, because I only have a, like 10 minutes left, I'm going to skip over this text processing stuff right now. Um, but it will be, you'll talk about it more um, in, in a later lecture. and. Um, you know, also these slides will be uploaded so you can you can check it out if you're interested. Um, but I want to get to uh, just some comments on the state of machine learning work today. Um, and I see some questions. How much machine learning code can be reused in different machine learning applications? Like how much of computer vision code could be reused when writing a chess AI? Um, so that's a, a good question. Um, I guess it depends on how you were going to be playing chess. Like if there was a vision component, um, generally like the software, uh, there's a bunch of software libraries that we use to develop machine learning. And I think you'll, you'll see some of those in the labs. Um, and you can use the same kind of functions to write all different kinds of machine learning algorithms, but typically like they'll have to be retrained for each different kinds of things you want to do. Um, can the training of models on white people affect computer vision models while testing on black people like in facial recognition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, all right. So, you know, we've kind of seen machine learning can do so many different things. It can play games, it can detect cancer, it can classify your emails, it can generate text, it can predict stock prices, and there's many, many more things that it can do. Um, but there are still a lot of known issues, unsolved problems, and open research questions in this space. So it's a really, really exciting field that is continuing to grow. Um, so there's space for many, many more people with um, you know, diverse perspectives and interests to be involved. Um, and I'm just highlighting here in the last few minutes some uh, uh, areas that I find particularly interesting um, in, in kind of ongoing machine learning work. Um, so in particular, um, a lot of the successful applications of machine learning that we've seen are currently very task specific. So different types of algorithms handle different are built to handle different types of data. Learning to do well on one task doesn't mean that your model will be able to do well on a different type of task. And another thing that I kind of think about um, a lot is that representations are generally um, not connected to each other. So if you have a language model, you know, that like learns about um, bird, writing about birds and you know, a computer vision model that learns to recognize birds, those things are not necessarily connected. Like we don't necessarily have in, in machine learning right now an idea of concepts um, the way that humans do, where we kind of recognize that like a cartoon bird is a bird a real bird is a bird, like a picture of a bird is a bird, a, a sentence about a bird is a bird. Those are all the same kind of um, idea um, that doesn't necessarily exist in, um, in machine learning right now, but ultimately there is a really big interest uh, in uh, what we call artificial general intelligence or AGI that more closely mimics human reasoning and human cognition. Um, and it's not really clear uh, yet how we could get there. Um, task specific models, um, like some of the language models or computer vision models that I mentioned are already really large. So it's not clear how we could kind of like bring more tasks together um, without, you know, making with the computing power that we have right now. Um, and you really need a lot of different kinds of systems, different kinds of information, different kinds of 
um, processes to work together to actually mimic human intelligence. So that's kind of what this um, diagram is showing over here. Like you have, you know, language processing, reactive processing, working memory, long-term memory, emotions, self, uh, concept of self and others, uh, reinforcement, all these different kinds of processes that really underlie human cognition. And, and we've done a good job at, at approximating some of these with machine learning, um, but not necessarily all of them and certainly not all of them um, together. Um, so, you know, this is a huge open area of research is, is how we can start to bring more of these things together. Um, and then another really, really interesting area, and, and I think uh, Sarah, who gave this lecture last year for these examples that I borrowed from her slides, um, is that model sizes, like I, I mentioned, continue to grow. A lot of the models that we use today are huge. Um, uh, they have a ton of learnable parameters, it takes a ton of data to train them, a ton of computing power, but uh, even with all of that, the relationship between those parameters and how the model actually works is generally not well understood, and we see some really interesting behaviors, um, particularly like diminishing returns. Um, as we've shown up here with some of those really large models, you need millions more parameters to eke out uh, just small gains. So particularly um, for this model that um, I've highlighted up here, you needed to almost double the amount of weights just to improve 2% in accuracy. Um, and, and that's pretty surprising and, and pretty inefficient. Um, and particularly other studies have shown there's a lot of redundancies and over-parameterization in a lot of machine learning models right now. Um, so you can use a small set of model parameters to predict others. Um, and in some cases, after training a really big model, you can remove a bunch of the parameters from the model and maintain the performance, but you can't necessarily start with a very small model and train it and get the same performance. And we don't understand why that's the case. This is a big, uh, again, open question of research. And you know, in addition to just understanding machine learning better, um, there's a real environmental cost to building these big machine learning models, training, um, I think it's BERT, which is one of the big language models that's used a lot, uh, training that model one time um, had, uh, emits the same amount of carbon dioxide as a transcontinental flight. So there are real environmental impacts of doing this kind of huge model development, giant training. Um, so by trying to understand how these models work better, we can be more efficient, more environmentally friendly. We can build more interpretable models um, where we really understand the behavior. And that is probably, um, well, I, I at least I believe that's a better direction for machine learning in the future. Um, Similarly, um, we often don't understand exactly what information a model is using to make a decision. Um, even if we try to probe that, like we saw with CNNs uh, and those filters, a lot of the features are not human interpretable. Um, but sometimes there are you know, known behaviors in the data set that we want to avoid. Maybe um, we're basing, we're training a, data, a model with historical data and we know that that historical data is biased and we don't want our network to exhibit that type of bias. Um, how do we prevent that if we don't understand how the network is leveraging its information? So interpretability is another really important area of research in machine learning. Um, and then, you know, like we've mentioned a few times, there are a lot of known issues with data bias where, um, uh, where models um, are trained on historical data. Uh, so in this example, um, this is a, a really famous um, recidivism prediction tool that uh, was used by judges or is used by judges um, to uh, predict who is likely to commit a, another crime and that's used to set bail for people. Um, and it's based on um, his data with historical biases uh, based on like in the US, which communities we police, how we have sentenced people in the past. We know there's racial bias um, in, in all of those aspects. 
And, and also the designers of this algorithm didn't uh, test the error across different classes. So in particular, the uh, one type of error, so people who are labeled high risk, but then did not commit another crime, that type of error disproportionately affected African Americans. And the other type of error, people who are labeled low risk, but did commit another crime, that type of misclassification was uh, predominantly in white people. So um, you, we see a very clear racial bias in this algorithm. Um, that could have been avoided potentially through different methods, like evaluating the different types of errors before you deploy it and thinking about the history of the data that you're using. So this is another big area of research is how we can try to prevent these biases, how we uh, collect and use data. Um, and similarly, the way we design systems, uh, is also another really interesting area of work. Um, so this, I think uh, the best example of this is with um, newsfeed or information creation algorithms. So for instance, how Facebook or Twitter or YouTube decide what content to show you. Um, like we talked about a bit earlier, um, typically the primary goal here and the kind of information they use is, is just keeping people interacting on the platform for as long as possible. So you wanna show people things that will, will keep them around, but this can and has led to kind of unintended behavior. We can think about you know, ways that an algorithm might uh, surface content that keeps people around, but has impacts that we don't want to have in society. So you know, creating information silos uh, where you click on information that you already agree with. And, and so the algorithm starts to only show you that information and maybe you miss out on diverse news sources. Um, and uh, radicalization pipelines, there's a really interesting study on YouTube um, that shows how uh, the YouTube algorithm would show people more and more extreme content uh, because that's a way of keeping people engaged on the website. And this has very real impacts on people, uh, you know, uh, coming to believe in conspiracy theories and other types of radicalization. Um, also, this can accelerate the spread of misinformation uh, and on all different kinds of things. And uh, unfortunately, research on some of these behavior is, is, is suppressed by the companies um, that develop these algorithms. So this is a really, really important space of work as well that I'm sure Emily will talk more about uh, in her lecture. Um, and then finally, um, the way we uh, deploy these systems is also uh, really important to consider. So an example that I mention a lot that I have here is um, Rite Aid deployed facial recognition systems only in low income areas, low income areas. Um, and this was, you know, nominally to help prevent shoplifting in their stores, um, but it raises a lot of, of questions. One, you know, like we mentioned, um, facial recognition, a lot of these systems have measurable bias. They don't work as well on minorities or women as they do on white males. So that's already an issue um, with the people who will be experiencing um, the errors of these systems. But also it raises questions of like privacy as an inherent right or an economic privilege. Like just because you live in a low income area, does that mean that you are forced to consent to uh, surveillance? Uh, that maybe more economically privileged areas uh, do not have to uh, consent to uh, and things like that. Um, and I have some more examples here that, you know, I encourage you to look at um, once the slides are uploaded. So I think I'm a bit over time already, um, but I think these are some really important questions to kind of consider um, as we think about, you know, continuing to use and develop machine learning. Um, you know, is it, are we okay with using models that are not interpretable? You know, what issues could arise if we do that? Uh, and these are, these are complex questions. So maybe in some cases it is okay to use models that aren't interpretable. In other cases, interpretability is really important. Um, what kind of trade-offs exist between efficiency and privacy? 
How do we mathematically define fairness and decide if a system is fair enough? How do we regulate these systems? I think these are all really important questions um, as we can um, continue to uh, design and build these systems. So um, to wrap up, you know, just a summary of machine learning, again, uh, just emphasizing this point, machine learning is, is the process of using statistics to find patterns in data sets without being explicitly programmed. Um, there are a lot of important considerations when developing these kind of models. You know, what kind of function are you trying to model? How do you evaluate your system? How do you check for bias? Uh, how do you collect your data? Do you have enough data? Is your data representative? All of these kind of things. Um, and I again want to emphasize that the, the development of, oops, of present day machine learning, where we're at today, really required insight and input from a ton of different fields and a ton of different people. And I think this is really still true today and very important that interdisciplinary approaches are key to continuing to innovate and doing so responsibly. So, you know, computer science is, and math is obviously important to machine learning, but I think there's a lot of other perspectives that are really critical as well. Um, and then I finally, you know, just want to highlight there are so many different opportunities to get involved in machine learning, and I hope that's um, like the main thing you take away from this lecture um, is that there are so many different things that machine learning can do and so many different types of open questions that we're still trying to understand. So it's a really, really exciting field um, with a lot of space to get involved. So, you know, you can do things like domain specific applications. I've done a lot with scientific applications. Um, in physics, but there's all kinds of different things you can do, you know, drug discovery, cancer detection, stock and market predictions, art generation, music creation, all kinds of different things. There's tons of social good applications as well, like helping allocate resources better, understanding community needs, improving government operations, helping make government systems more efficient, um, getting resources to people more efficiently. Um, there's lots of those fundamental research questions talked about, like um, understanding the impact of model size, interpretability, developing new types of machine learning algorithms, um, making sure that our systems are safe and robust, and then uh, broader contextualization. So thinking about how we regulate these systems, how we design them, how we involve the community, how we develop da safe data practices, how we prioritize privacy, and all these different things. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really, really exciting space. Um, and I hope after this, uh, y'all do too, and you're excited for the, um, for the rest of the week. Um, so I put my email address and Twitter on here. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know if there's time for questions now, I'll, I'll defer to the uh, organizers, um, but if there is, I'm of course happy to answer them. Uh, let's let's take this moment to thank Savannah for this excellent lecture. Um, I believe uh, we can uh, answer a few questions if you have time. Um, I know that like in terms of the program, the office hours are starting right now, but I believe we can answer a few questions. Obviously, like probably not all of them, but. Um, if you have a couple of minutes, that would be yeah. great. I yeah. see some questions in the Q and A, uh, Q and A section. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, would AGI mirror concepts such as assimilation and accommodation, according to Jean Piaget? So, unfortunately, I do not know exactly what that means. Um, I'm not familiar with Jean Piaget. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I can't answer that unless you provide maybe more information. So sorry about that. Um, AGI helps a computer understand a human's line of thinking. Um, so AGI, artificial general intelligence, is uh, more kind of a goal or a descriptor of like the type of intelligence that we want a computer uh, to approximate or exhibit. Um, it's not something that I would say like exists right now. It's not a specific algorithm or a specific paradigm, um, but 
it is uh, kind of a goal uh, uh, that you know some researchers want to get to. Um, that would be you know a more closer uh, uh, closer uh, kind of model of how humans actually think than the way we do machine learning right now. Um, what are the AI for social good use cases to think uh, some machine learning algorithms to apply? Yeah, so there's a ton of different stuff in the social good space. So something that I work on personally is um, understanding public health needs. Um, so uh, we did a project uh, looking at doing effective uh, mobile health resource routing. So if you have like mobile health vans that can kind of drive around and um, do pop-up clinics, what areas need that kind of help the most? Um, so we looked at um, a lot of different kinds of data like um, health insurance, uh, distributions, um, actual like infrastructure for accessing hospitals. So if you're in a city like public transportation um, from different areas, if you're in more rural areas, like actual road infrastructure, um, the number of doctors and like availability of care in different areas, um, people, the prevalence of different diseases, uh, people who need, you know, uh, assistance who maybe uh, are, don't speak English fluently um, or who don't have access to the internet. And we um, kind of use all that information to help do efficient routing. So that's just one example. There's tons of different things you can do. Um, uh, we mentioned satellite imagery briefly. So there's a lot of work doing like disaster response uh, with computer vision. So um, uh, responding to floods or earthquakes using um, satellite imagery and computer vision to, to know where to um, target resources to. Um, there's all different kinds of things. Those are just like two examples. Um, great question. Um, let's see. Uh, would pursuits and tools and research teams differ from a more corporate engineering team? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. So definitely different types of spaces um, definitely do different types of AI work. So personally, I'm in academia still. So I work in an academic uh, research lab where I really uh, right now kind of define my own projects. Uh, and they generally don't have to be in any specific direction. Um, if you're in more corporate structures, it kind of depends on the role. So like big tech companies have research branches as well, like Facebook, uh, Google, they have AI research um, branches that are a bit more like academia. Uh, but then there's also more kind of engineering focused teams that do more product driven work. So using uh, machine learning actually in products, doing ad targeting, or um, some of these different applications that we talked about. Um, let's see. Um, AI technology <clears throat> will grow faster in countries with large uh, populations such as China and India because more data are available for machines to learn and analyze. Is that true? That's a really interesting question. Um, so we are seeing actually that AI is growing faster in China in particular. Um, and it's partially what you're saying about the availability of data sets, but it's partially also like the way the government and kind of country is structured, like there's more forced surveillance in China uh, than in some Western countries. So uh, that both gives you more training data and also just more opportunities to deploy machine learning. Um, there's also a lot of investment in China in just machine learning research. Um, I think they surpassed, like in terms of publication, surpassed the US recently. Um, so yes, China is definitely a powerhouse in, in AI. Uh, and machine learning research for, for several different reasons. Um, some of them are potentially concerning, um, but uh, I think a, a key thing to think about there is, you know, just having more people doesn't necessarily give you more data. Like you have to have ways to collect the data uh, and, 
you know, that raises concerns about privacy, surveillance, bias, all of these things that we want to consider. So, um, yeah, very interesting question. Um, so maybe uh, we have time to for just like one or two more questions. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, would one difference between AI and human intelligence be that human intelligence voluntarily seek information while input is voluntarily put into the system of artificial intelligence? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So there are different types of AI systems. So like, um, you know, maybe we can think about a self-driving car. So when a self-driving car is operating, it is constantly taking in information from its sensors. So it has uh, cameras and other types of physical sensors all around the car. So that's probably the closest to like, I think what you're seeing with human intelligence, like we're just getting input all the time by living our daily lives, we're getting visual, auditory stimuli. Um, and you can design kind of AI systems that function that way as well. But yeah, a lot of them, you know, uh, uh, to, to kind of learn how to function, you're right, they have to be specifically trained. Whereas, you know, the way that humans learn is, is through teaching, through school, but also kind of just through observations, like babies learn uh, a lot about language just by listening to language. And, and we can't necessarily do that with AI right now. Like we can't, the system can't necessarily just learn uh, without being shown curated information and given some specific task. Um, all right, let's see one more question. What made you dive into the physics logistics and making AI? Um, yeah, I love that question. So I originally in college um, wanted to do physics research, um, which is why I, I uh, went into a physics PhD program. And I did learn, uh, I did do some computer science in college. Um, and my field of, of physics, this uh, uh, particle physics is very data heavy. Um, so I started doing more and more data analysis, more computer science, and I learned about machine learning like because of that. Um, and I realized kind of how interesting, how broad this space of work really was. And uh, a lot of the kind of ethical concerns that I mentioned, the social good applications, those are all things that I really cared about as well. Um, so I kind of found machine learning research as a space where I could really bring all of my different interests together. So like data analysis and coding, math, um, physical kind of modeling um, and the social impact. So it kind of happened organically for me um, through my research. Um, yeah, awesome. Thank you all so much. I, it was really great to hear your questions and your insights. Um, and I really enjoyed yeah, chatting with y'all and I ho hope you enjoy the rest of the school. Yeah, thank you so much, Savannah. Um, yeah, we are super excited for the rest of the program. And if you have any remaining questions, please uh, put them on the Discord channel. And uh, today we have the uh, lab sessions later in the afternoon, as well as the social event. So yeah, super excited for the rest of the day and the rest of this week. And uh, thank you again, Savannah, for this uh, excellent lecture. And uh, see you all like later today and yeah thanks a lot everyone so with this i end this session